Welcome, I'm Mikaji no Kami, and today's review is Godzilla vs. Megaguirus. After Godzilla 2000's success at the box office, Toho immediately began production on another Godzilla film. This time decided to create a brand new monster by the name of Megaguirus, which resembled a giant dragonfly. However, this was not all, as this movie also signaled the return of the insect creatures from Rodan called Mega Nulan, and Megaguirus was their king. Kenji Suzuki returned for the special effects, but this time Toho brought in a new director and composer team. The director chosen was first-timer Masaki Tezuka, and Mishiro Oshima who would go on to score the live-action Sailor Moon series and Full Metal Alchemist. Together, this trio made what was hoped to be a box office success. Was it? Like Godzilla 2000, this movie takes place in its own universe. It begins with a report letting us know that Godzilla had attacked Japan in 1954 and then disappeared. Hey. Was the cream filling? He returned once again in 66 for more nuclear energy. The Japanese government outlawed the use of nuclear power from this point forward, and as such, a new cleaner energy solution was being developed. By 1996, plasma energy was the new source, but then Godzilla emerged once more, causing Japan to cease production on that plan. Here we are introduced to Kiriko Sujimori, played by Masato Tanaka. Her unit has been dispatched to take on Godzilla with... Uh... Rocket launchers? Unsurprisingly, they are no match to the wild beast and Sujimori's commander is killed saving her. Five years pass and Sujimori is now the commander of an anti-Godzilla unit known as G-Grasper. They recruit a young micro-machines expert named Hajime Kudo. Shosuke Tanahara portrays the goofball genius. Sujimori takes Kudo to G-Grasper's headquarters where he learns that his former teacher, Yoshino Yoshizawa, is in charge of their science division, which has been broken up and named Search, Study, and Shelter. Yoshizawa is played by returning Godzilla star Yuriko Hoshi, whom you may remember as Junko in Mothra vs. Godzilla, and Shinoda's sister Naoko in Gira the Three-Headed Monster. She explains to Kudo that she is developing a black hole system that will be able to free the world of Godzilla's terror and that his help is required in making this dream a reality. Kudo agrees and after three months they are ready to test out the device. A young boy named June witnesses the task and is confronted by Sujimori, who asks him not to talk about what he had seen. June also has some enticing words for her. That's not sexist. I'm saying it because it's true. That night, June sees a strange monster fly past his window, so of course he goes out looking for it. In the forest, he finds a strange egg and decides to take it to Shibuya with him. He soon dumps it into the sewer to get rid of it. Uh, is it just me, or has this underground river gotten higher? Flooding suddenly occurs in Shibuya, and the Mega Nulan start killing people. One of them sheds into a flying form known as a Mega Nula. Godzilla is located and Suji Mori and her crew head out to confront him in their ship called the Griffon. They find him and we are treated to a spectacle of a scene which is probably the best one in the movie. She shoots a tracking bullet and the Godzilla's back so they can trace him anywhere. In the meantime, the black hole gun, known as the Dimension Tide, is sent out into space on a satellite. Shibuya has been completely flooded to the point where everyone has to be evacuated. The military sends out some mini subs as they want to try to find out what is happening beneath the sea. Under the sea, under the sea, darling it's better down where it's wetter, take it from me. Godzilla is found once again, so the Griffin is sent out to lure him to a remote, uninhabited island that will allow the Dimension Tide to be used without the fear of any casualties. Unfortunately, a swarm of Mega Nulas attack Godzilla, making it impossible for the Dimension Tide to aim properly. The cannon is fired as soon as they are able to do so.
Godzilla manages to escape the grasp of the black hole's pole and leaves the island just shortly after the Meganulas have left. We start to learn that the G-Grasper's founder, Sugura, is not the honest man he seems, and... I'm bored! Let's go! <sighs> Where was I? <sighs> the swarm returns to Shibuya and uses the energy they acquired from Godzilla to wake up their king, a monster known as Megagirus. Megagirus rises from the deaths and causes massive destruction over the area, injuring Kudo in the process. Godzilla arrives on Tokyo Bay and the G-Graspers are dispatched to intercept him and we learn that the government never actually rid themselves of all the plasma energy as they kept it locked away in a lab in Tokyo, hence why Godzilla went there. Godzilla and Megagirus fight each other, but the battle is one-sided due to Megagirus' ability to fly. Yoshizawa tries to fire the Dimension Tide at the battle, but Megagirus' high-frequency waves make it impossible to do so as it interferes with their remote system. This causes Kudo to rip off his cast and begin to work on repairing the system with a very strange avatar of Sujimori on his computer. I am an adult. Back to the battle, the tide has turned as Godzilla slices off one of Mega Gears' claws and uses his tail to whip the prehistoric insect across the city. He then body slams him. Look at this! He's I don't believe it! Blood. Over for the cover! It's over! I never thought it could be done, Dorella! Oh yeah, and there seems to be a lot of slowdowns happening during this fight, and I'm not really sure why. Take this scene, I have not altered the footage in any way. Not sure why they did it, but it adds nothing to the movie other than some additional seconds we could do without. Megagirus tries to sting Godzilla in the face with his stinger, but Godzilla catches it with his mouth. Dang it! I hate it when I accidentally bite down on Trim Tail! Godzilla blows Megagirus up, and Sujimori uses the Griffin as the target for the now descending Dimension Tide to hit in hopes of destroying Godzilla. The attack appears successful, and even though Godzilla's beam blows the Blast Meteor, massive destruction is caused around Tokyo and Godzilla is gone. Some time passes and Sujimori comes back to Kudo to tell him that Godzilla might not have been caught in the blast after all, and that they still need his help. <laughs> Oh, what? You can't be serious. That can't be how you're seriously ending the movie. That... hold on. Hey, movie? Uh, I don't think you're over yet. That wasn't an ending, that was just stopping. Oh, there's more after the credits? Okay. Never mind, it is just June in school with an earthquake and we hear Godzilla's roar. I've got nothing. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Get on with it! I feel like the movie is overall a mixed bag. It isn't downright terrible, it is just mediocre at best because it has horrible pacing. The movie does an okay job at letting us know what their universe is like, but I also feel that takes away from it because it completely changes the outcome of the original movie. There are some good ideas utilized though, as I like the concept about Japan having to find different means of energy. However, everything just comes off generic and boring to the point that the movie drags on a lot. There could have easily been a good 15 to 20 minutes cut out and the plot would not have been hindered in the slightest. Hell, cutting everything out that dealt with Sugura and June probably would have improved the movie significantly. 
June serves no purpose whatsoever outside of being the reason Shibuya gets flooded. His amazement that a woman is in the military is also very degrading, but I guess that's just the culture in a nutshell. He isn't the worst child actor of the franchise though. The other characters seem to be bored and ready to fall asleep. Hell, Sujimori can give Yuki a run for his money and who holds less emotion. I understand the purpose Tezuka was trying to get here since she did lose her commander and blames herself, but it feels like Tanaka was just going through the motions of the movie instead of acting with them. Kudo is easily the best character to be found here as he brings a unique spin into the mix. I like that he's just a computer technician rather than a soldier or a scientist. I do like him a lot, although things do get a little weird with his computer avatar being designed after Sujimori. That is kind of creepy. I did like getting to see an actor from the Showa era back that didn't feel completely wasted. Yoshizawa isn't great, but she isn't bad. Plus, she doesn't constantly spew out that we are destroying the Earth, so that was a nice change of pace. Her want to get rid of Godzilla due to the loss of her friends and colleagues is well done as she isn't doing it out of cold-blooded revenge. And if she is, it doesn't feel like it. She gives off the sense that she just wants to free the world from his terror so that no one else has to experience what she had. Sugura could have been a good villain-esque character had it not been so obvious that he was up to no good right from the get-go. He just screamed selfish dick the moment he was introduced. I'm not sure if that is because of the way he is written, or the fault of his actor, Masato Ibu. Nevertheless, he does not do a great job of hiding his true intentions. It is such a shame that Toho couldn't find a batch of characters as interesting as they did with 2000. Then again, this movie feels rushed and was rushed, so it probably shouldn't be that surprising. The Godzilla design is the same as it was in 2000, but with some alterations to the face and his color is a much brighter green and purple. I am not a fan of this color at all. He looks way too bright as if he suddenly just decided to take up a job as a neon sign. One thing I do love though is that he uses his tail as a weapon in this movie. Whacking the Mega Nulas and using it to toss Mega Gears across the battlefield was great to watch. I wish we had more moments like this as it has been a long time since he has used his tail effectively. Mega Gears looks good for what he was supposed to be, but he can't do much. I like that they gave him claws to try to separate him from Mothra and Batra. I just wish he was Batra instead. The design itself is pretty unique though, and that is what matters more for me. I love his color scheme. It was so nice to see something new done again, and a more earthly type monster, even though he is meant to be from an alternate dimension. The CGI remains to be the worst aspect of the effects. Just like in 2000, they are horrible looking. The miniatures also do not seem to be as good as they were previously too. They are still a notable improvement over the Heisei miniatures, but they feel rushed compared to those from 2000. It is a shame Toho did not have Godzilla Mega Gears fight in the flooded area of Tokyo though, as that could have been a truly unique moment for the franchise. The best effect for me goes to the scene when Sujimori is on Godzilla. You can clearly tell she is CGI'd in there, but the sheer sense of scale is awe-inspiring and the shot is whimsical. Another really good looking scene is when Godzilla battles the Mega Nulas on the island. Oshima's score is freaking amazing. Every piece of her music fits with the movie and adds to each scene rather than hinder it. In fact, I think she is by far the best Godzilla composer next to Akira Afukabe. Her new Godzilla theme is very original and catchy. So much so, that it will still be in your head for days after you watch the movie. The battle music is also great and keeps you up for the fight scenes, but that fight scene is boring. Very boring. And when there is no music to it, it is a chore to watch. Godzilla vs. Mega Gears is definitely the weakest of the Millennium series, but it does have some really good moments sprinkled throughout. For a first attempt, Tesla did do a great job in some areas, but needs work in others. 
The characters are boring. The pacing is awful. Thankfully though, the score is phenomenal and keeps you engaged in the movie, and there are some really good defining moments for it. Well, that is all the time I have for this episode. Join me next time as I bring in the big bad GMK. Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack. Bye.